All right, but let's dive into the big news of the day now that we've gone through our regular social pleasantries. And uh, that is, obviously, the Miles Brennan news. And uh, if you missed it yesterday, which I doubt you did, if you're watching this show. In fact, this is probably like your third or fourth time hearing people break down the Miles Brennan conversation. But the two words that I keep going back to, Jake, are hard work and heartbreak, right? I talk about this all the time, but... These off-seasons are so long and so brutal and so grindy, right? And what do you do it all for? Like, you work out year-round, you run year-round, you lift everything year-round, you put all this effort in. What do you do? You do that all for the payoff of playing time. And so to consistently devote your life to this craft and put everything you have in it, and who consistently, for one reason or another, not get that payoff, it is absolutely disheartening. And everybody's point is going to be different when they reach this point, but at a certain point, you're just done. Like You only have so much to give, and it's fascinating for a couple of reasons in that, um, well, I, I, I feel like the reaction has been actually a little encouraging, right? I expected to see a lot more of like the Jake Crane takes where it's like he quit and rah, 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 rah. there's been a yeah. surprising amount of empathy, uh, I think, out of the LSU fan base who has followed Miles' career as closely as anyone has. And it's because when you really look at it, uh, I think empathy is probably the play here. Uh, there's a saying, Jake, that I always go back to, right? My old man always said, you know, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. I guess what we never think about is like other times. You can be so unlucky that it doesn't matter if you're good. And that, and that that's kind of what has happened to Miles Brennan in that every time it seemed like he was close or every time he had finally achieved the goal, something would go awry and end up resetting the table, and then it just never quite worked out for him. And in the end, uh, you, you it's, it's, it's a career filled with um, – a lot of potential that ultimately went unrealized. Like I said it yesterday, but you'd be a hard pressed to find a better statistical three game sample size than what you saw out of him to never play again. Now I wouldn't be surprised if he isn't done with football quite yet. Right. I mean, uh, maybe, maybe get a few weeks out from this thing and look, there's a lot of avenues now, right? I, I don't know exactly what he could finagle on the college eligibility level if you really wanted to, but There are things like the USFL, the XFL, the CFL. Like There are other avenues in which you can try to continue this. Maybe he does. Maybe he doesn't. But I definitely understand where he's at at this point in his life right now, feeling like um, he's just done, just feeling done with it all. I think even the people that are like, yeah, yeah, he quit, quit. You know, it's like, well, let me lay it out for you. Because I was listening to Dusty and Danny in the morning on the way in. And Danny was out, and Ben Hartsock was sitting in for him. And Dusty's like, man, come on, why are you quitting? Why didn't you finish? And, and 99.9% of the time, I'm like that as well. But Ben laid it out for him. He laid it out since Miles got to campus, the quarterback competitions he had been in, the injuries that he ha- had suffered, and just you know the one that he got on the field. Doctors had literally never seen it before. Yeah, Didn't know what to do. You're talking about doctors with a lot of experience on college and professional teams. He was going across the country. Nobody knew what to do with it. Do you have surgery? And if you have surgery, what kind of surgery are we going to have here? And they let it heal. So he goes through that. He gets in an accident right before training camp last year that we all know about. That's very unfortunate for him. And just so many trials and tribulations and so many ebbs and flows and everything that just happened in Miles' career makes it a very unique career in the way that it played out. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, like, and also when you come to that realization – that you don't fully want to be in it anymore, it is very difficult to stay in it. Yeah. Um, I can tell you, and, and when you get your your sunshine and your joy stolen from you because you're in this position battle, and in your mind, you're like, I should be number one in this position battle, or what's going on here? And I don't know if I've ever said this on this show. I think I have, but like going from my fourth year where I was second in the Pro Bowl, I was an alternate, to my fifth year, the Chargers decided to change up some things in the offense and go away from what they had been running. And so they didn't have really a need for a fullback. Now, I resigned with San Diego. I was a team captain the year before on special teams. I signed with them. And there was a time right before training camp where it just hit me, man, you've, you've been a starter all four years you've been here. And you're about to 
get a very, very decreased role in this football team. And training camp's about to start. And I, I picked up the phone. I called Nor uh, North Turner. And if he would have answered, I was done. Really? He didn't answer the phone. I went to camp, ended up playing a, a, another year and a half in the league. But if he had answered that phone, I was, I was going to be done. Because I, my joy of football had been taken from me because I had always been someone who played. And I felt like I just had my best year in year four of my NFL career. Yeah. And then for whatever reason... Because there were some things and North had to win. They changed up the offense. They went away from what we were doing. And I was basically like just sitting there and wasn't going to be playing. And for me, I was like, man, this is this is just not the same as it's always been. And it can happen extremely fast to you. And once it happens, it's very, very difficult to get it back. Now I was able to go to Denver and that that helped, right? I got yeah. my joy back and I and I wanted to play football and I was kind of right back to where I was. But in that moment, in that spot. I called him, and he didn't answer. And if he would have answered, I was done. Well, and, and it's interesting, right, because I, too, have a bit of a personal anecdote in the document today, and that's because the end of your athletic career, and anybody listening can appreciate this, uh, it is relative. There is no hard and fast rule set for when you decide that you are done. Like, sometimes you're just finished. Like, when I was trying to make it in the league, right, and I ended up getting cut those last days, uh, I, I had had a solid preseason. I played a bunch in all of the preseason games. Right? I was on the edge of practice squad. I probably could have like continued to stay in shape, you know, keep working out, see what came about in the NFL meat market, right? Maybe catch on somewhere else, attempt to do that. But I was just done with it all. And 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 I think what everybody wants to know is okay after you finish. How do you look back on it? And it's 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 odd because like I don't know about you, Jake. When I look back, the only regrets that I have are more pride based than anything else, right? Sure, the money would have been great. You know, that's what the NFL. It's one of the best parts about it is making really good money, right? But I like my job. Like I'm content doing this job. I'm not constantly filled with an anxiety that like uh, oh if I have a bad day at the office that could mean you know I'm out, right? Like you're going to lose your job. That constant kind of like fear of failure, but it does hurt your pride a little bit, right? Like you, I would have loved to be able to say that I had made it in the NFL, even if it was only for a couple of years. And I'm sure that Miles has experienced some of that same injured pride here as well. But, 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 but I do think that sort of regret is kind of the most normal thing in the world. Cause like the same way that when you're done is relative, rare is the athlete that looks back at what they achieved and has total satisfaction, right? Like, every, it doesn't matter how far you made it relative to somebody else. The chances are you had bigger goals for yourself than you hit. Or the goals you accomplished, you were pleased with. But the reason why you accomplished them is because you were always aiming higher. You were always striving for more. And so uh, it's like everything else in life. I feel that it's uh, kind of where we fall short sometimes that stands out the most. So definitely, as you prepare to enter the non-sporting world and you've kind of defined yourself through the prism of football for an entire life that's a big adjustment period and it always will be but a lot of times you will find even with maybe some of those regrets that yeah man you 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 got more going on and that uh, there is more out there in life than football and when you look at miles i mean for six years now it has been just a constant uphill battle uh, Shea Dixon had a great tweet that kind of summed it up, right? He battled nine scholarship quarterbacks in six years for those playing time. He was recruited or played for three different head coaches, recruited, played for five different offensive coordinators in the last six years to give you an idea of just how up and down it has been here. He had the great three starts. He had multiple season engine injuries. It was just a constant uphill battle. And that has a way of draining you. So, I wish nothing but the best for Miles Brennan. You all know, um, of course, I've been very upfront about this. Um, he is engaged to my cousin as well, so a, a future uh, family member and, and, and a good friend. And so, obviously, I do have a personal stake in this as well. But uh, I, I, think, I think most everybody uh, wishes nothing but the best for Miles. But where it becomes more interesting for this LSU team now, Jake, is that Mike Denbrock's timeline is shaping up, right? When we talked to him a few weeks ago, he said around this point in camp, they wanted more clarity. And now when you look from three, then there were two. And 
what's interesting to me about all of this, Jake, is the guy that really gets the kill to his name, if you want to frame it in such crass terms, is Garrett Nussmeyer. Because it is his emergence that made this room too crowded, right? If Miles was still top two, uh, he would still be playing for the LSU Football Tigers. Right. It was the emergence of the young gun with not much experience who kind of forced his way out. Like Garrett Nussmeyer was the one that was supposed to be the one fighting the uphill battle. Coming into the season, I told you, this was the final opportunity for both Miles Brennan and Jaden Daniels to make their football dreams come true. Nuss has time left, but he wants to make his dreams come true too. He's not going to be patient. He doesn't want to wait. He feels like he already has waited. And, well, now you look. Nuss has slain one of those two on their final opportunity, and now he has his set sight on Daniels, who admittedly will be harder to take out, right? I mean, he has much more experience with the 30 starts. He's been playing well. They've basically been splitting those one reps evenly. But Garrett Nussmeyer, in my opinion, is the big takeaway from all of this because it is his emergence that made this room too crowded. Yeah, and it's not just from fall camp. It's going back all the way to the spring. In the spring, he made it very difficult for this to be a two-man race. He made it a three-man race because of his play. I thought in the spring that he was the better quarterback because he flashed and he made plays and he continued to improve too during spring. And you always notice that during the spring months. And so now we sit here and we know that it is a two-quarterback battle, but it also it does have a Walker Howard that gives you, it does give you some um, some belief that you've still got a really good quarterback room because nobody has four quarterbacks. I mean, that was a luxury. So now you know you still have three quality quarterbacks. I mean, your third string guy was, you know, a top three pocket passer in the country coming out of high school. So, but it being a two man race, now you are, what, 19 days away from game time? 19 days. So Not very long, folks. You get to this weekend. Let's say you get to the 21st, two weeks from game time. I mean, I don't know that they're going to name a starter by Sunday, the 21st, but if you did, that would give that quarterback two full weeks to get all the one. Reps. And so if you're looking at a timeline, maybe that's when you kind of can figure it out. Because even now, I know a lot of people think they have it figured out, but it is still a quarterback battle. Like, don't take one day of practice as gospel. I mean, every day over there is changing in practice. So it is still a quarterback battle. I don't think that there's been a decision made yet. Yeah, Wash Out says, Team Up, how is Nelson one to retire Brennan, but Daniels will be the starter? Makes zero sense. Well, that's the point. I, I don't think it's uh, at all written in stone that Daniels will be the starter. I think um, now the, the the practice that the media got to see, uh, Garrett Nussmeyer was out, and Jaden Daniels basically took all of the ones reps. Uh, Jake, I don't know if you can confirm or deny this, but everything I have heard is that that rhythm has been split evenly amongst Daniels and Nussmeyer. It was Miles who was not getting the full allotment of one reps. Like, it was not a... <laughs> Uh, fully equivocal three-man rotation. It was equivocal two-man rotation with a third thrown in. So now I would imagine those reps are going to be split evenly down the middle until they make a decision about who uh, gets to be the one. And, and as Jake said, maybe that comes uh, about in another week, somewhere around there, a few more days. I'm sure they got some scrimmages coming up uh, that would go a long way towards determining that. But uh, no, I guess the overall point there, wash your mouth, is that Again, the, the reason why I'm, I'm saying it's Nuss is because it's his emergence that made the room too crowded, but also Jaden Daniels is not the starter just yet. It is a two-man, a true two-man competition for who will be under center in a couple of weeks. Uh, all right, when we get back here on OTB, I want to uh, continue to talk some college football. We have the AP poll out. I want to talk a little about the uh, LSU defensive line as well. Also... Um, I'm starting to do a little Florida State reading, man, and uh, they're feeling confident. Florida State feeling pretty good about Mike Norvell here in year number three, I think, under Norvell. Uh, you may be asking yourself why. We'll get into some of that. And I have a question about a key difference in Florida State and LSU's schedule and what kind of impact it will have. So keep it locked right here. Look, if you're on YouTube.com slash 104.5 ESPN, hit the like button. Come hang out with us all morning long. Uh, it's going to be a great day, and uh, we will see you on the other side. <laughs>